Thank you for braving the traffic to be here. Um, tonight we're going to talk a little bit around financial frameworking, how you create a sustainable financial framework for yourself. Uh, some of the pitfalls, what makes it tricky, and in the end, just some ideas on, on, on how to do it safely and how to do it sustainably. So I'm going to start off with a quote from arguably the world's greatest investor, certainly living investor. And um, he says the following, and let's just try and cut this down into words of, of, of small and short syllables. The first thing he says, you don't have to be a genius to create a successful investment strategy or a successful investment framework. What he does say is two things in that second paragraph. He says, A, you need a plan. And secondly, he says, you need the means or the wherewithal to protect the plan from yourself. And the word emotion you'll see is mentioned there. And I, I'm going to spend a little bit of time during the course of the evening talking about emotion and, and the danger of emotion when it comes to structuring a financial framework. The dictum our investment team uses, the dictum we use in doing any kind of planning is the following, and that is the future will, will always surprise you. So the minute you think you know exactly what's going to happen next, you know exactly what doesn't happen next. Um, and we had a... a a conference of our partners a little while ago and I asked the question, it turns out two-thirds of our, our partners have been in the industry or in our business for between 15 and 20 years and I said to them, your number, that includes you by the way, if you've been interested in the markets for, for, for longer than 15 years, that includes you. Your number is five, five and two. Five market corrections and, and look, technically I'm saying anything more than 10%. So you've seen five market corrections, you've seen five RAND crises, believe it or not, and you've seen two emerging market crises. Now, Chatting amongst my partners, the interesting thing is that, that while these things look similar looking back, leading up to them, they all had very, very different conditions. And if you would have thought you could call what would happen next, absolutely not. The future surprised in each case. South Africa is unfortunately littered with tragic examples of, of wealth destruction. Um, all too often we see, we see instances like this. So for example, investing with a single or a radical outcome in mind. You never structure an investment strategy with a, radical, with a radical view in mind. Because what if it doesn't happen? Uh, a client of mine the other day, and, and I say this with respect, son uh, in his second year at a bank told him that the RAND was going to 25, so he needs to take all his money offshore. That's investing with a single outcome in mind. Then single stock disasters. Uh, we won't mention any names, but go back a decade and you, you can think of, of several of them. Um, a classic example is all your options are in in, in, uh, in your business. And of course the share price doesn't do what you expected it to do, in fact it tanks. Um, not six months goes by where you don't hear about another pyramid scheme somewhere in South Africa where people have been fleeced at their life savings. It's just unbelievable, it just never, never stops. And people don't learn. And of course collapsing institutions, Abel being probably the most recent one in our minds, uh, the one that I started off in my career uh, uh, recalling is, is Masterbond. And it's sandwiched in between those um, hundreds of them. Then we see advice lacking substance. That little bit of advice I told you about earlier, you know, the RAND's going to go to 25, panic, take it all offshore. There's no substance to that advice. And then lastly, it's my experience that greed is a much bigger driver of investment strategy than fear is. And that's why I think we find that people get themselves into trouble. So, three critical questions as we start to define our path along creating a financial framework. And you might query the wording there, what is enough or not, why, why did I not say um, how much is enough? So what is enough for, for you as an individual? What is enough work? What is enough lifestyle when you are finished working? It's not just a question of, 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 of how much money. Secondly, how do you value the true worth of your success? Is it an amount, an amount of money? Uh, is it being able to work because you want to work, not because you have to work? Or is it being able to provide for yourself, for, your, for, the, for the generations beyond you and the generations beyond that? Value doesn't just lie in a quantum. And then lastly, how do you bring meaning to that? And maybe we can think through that little concept as we go through tonight. So in setting a framework for yourself to make consistent decisions, the first thing you need to try and do is, is to just understand what, what you want the future to look like for yourself beyond the stuff you're doing right now. If you can do that, you can then start to design what that will look like. And then lastly, you can create it through the kind of frameworking we're going to go through this evening. 
Any questions so far on, on what we've covered? Please stop me at any stage. All right. So what I want to share with you this evening, firstly, is just some lessons from experience that, that we as a collective um, have gone through uh, in the period that we've been doing this. Secondly, any discussion around setting a framework has got to be in a moment of maximum vulnerability for yourself. Because A, you will always overestimate the value of your assets. Secondly, you will always underestimate how much you're going to spend. So when you start thinking through this stuff and trying to design it, just be completely, impeccably, brutally honest. And then lastly, and, and I think events in South Africa um, bring this particular concept to me quite starkly. People are a little bit impatient. Um, we see fancy cars driving around and we want them now. To do this kind of thing, to create wealth for yourself over time, takes time and it takes patience. And it takes some hard lessons, but it doesn't happen quickly. Unless, of course, you're very lucky or very corrupt. So, this is what a basic framework is going to look like. And I'll take you through it. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover each block in a little bit of detail. And then I'm going to cover this third block in even more detail. All right, so, so the first quadrant we're going to look at are our business assets. This is what we do for a living. It's what occupies our day. And we do this for a very, very long period of time, hoping to create enough to sustain us and the next generation and our lifestyles. I won't spend too much time on the underlying rules. Um, I'll, I'll, as I say, I'll cover those in a bit more detail. The second quadrant is, 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 is lifestyle assets. So the pleasure that the first quadrant will give us. Okay? And that's buying us houses, toys, cars, beach cottages, Holly Davidsons, etc., etc. The third quadrant is what we take out of this first quadrant to sustain us beyond the time that that first quadrant has ended. Now, I'll come back to this, but firstly, there's, there is a massive tension between quadrants two and quadrants three from quadrant one. Okay, so what, what goes to which quadrant at what time? And then the fourth quadrant is really around when you have enough of three, you can start to create four for yourself. But three is the critical one. Okay, bear with me. I'll cover this in, in a little bit more detail. Okay, let's have a look at quadrant one. This is the only source of wealth. What we do, our blood, sweat, and tears on a daily basis, is the only way that we can create wealth. And when people ask me about investing and returns, and my answer is that I could, we could never make more money for you than you can make in this quadrant. If you do, if we can make more money for you than you can make in your business, you don't run a very good business. Okay, so this thing should always be the big driver. This is the wealth creator. It is the only source of wealth. What it does demand, of course, is, is very intense, very subjective involvement. If we run businesses, we run them with gut feel, we run them with passion, we run them with energy. There's a lot of subjective involvement. There's a lot of concentration of resources, particularly if you own a business. Everything is in one thing. Okay, and that's normal in this particular quadrant. It's normal to be liquid. Of course, if your money's tied up into your business, there's very little way of getting it out until you ultimately sell the business. Okay. In a slightly different context, if you work in a corporate, you'll have possibly have money tied up in options or in your pension fund. That's not liquid stuff. You can't get to it. You can't access it. So illiquidity in this quadrant one while you're building is completely normal. And if you're running a business, it's okay to gear. It's okay to create debt for yourself. Why? Okay, because of course the cost of your debt is deductible from tax. So if, you, if you've got a prime related rate, nine and a half, you probably only end up paying five. Because the interest is an expense in the, in the production of income. So it's okay to gear in your business. And of course this can take a lifetime. We spoke about time and patience a little bit earlier. Any questions on quadrant one? Okay, so this is the wealth creator, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, there's a tension between one and two because one needs to provide you with two. 
Okay, now there's clearly an imbalance in that picture there. But quadrant two is around that stuff. Now we don't all own fancy boats, we don't all own beach cottages, but it is stuff like your house. And firstly, it's not an asset, it's joy. Why would we not qualify it as, an, as, a, as a pure asset, by the way? Exactly, okay. So it's, it's, a, passion, it's a passion investment. Um, and that would include the other stuff, as we spoke about earlier, the motorbikes, the jet skis, the beach cottages, etc., etc. So just very simply, don't overinvest. These need to be a function of success. They shouldn't be something you invest in and then have to achieve to, in order to pay for them. Um, sadly, we see a lot of that. Why is debt not good here? Exactly. Okay. All right. So be very, very careful of debt here. And, and here's the big point. These are concentration thieves of note because they demand your attention because only you look after them. Okay. Any questions on that second quadrant? Right, so part of quadrant one is going to go into quadrant two to pay for this stuff. Now the tension exists between lifestyle assets and this because how much goes there and how much goes here. And we just call this living the dream. It's eventually doing what you've always wanted to do. So firstly, what is your number? Now let's not worry too much about the detail. Now. I'm going to come back to each of these points. Okay. So the first thing you need to do is you need to secure sufficient assets and protect them. Now, the word secure is quite important because in moving from quadrant one, which remember is one thing, which means that one thing could also destroy it. Okay, so this process of moving money from quadrant one to quadrant two is changing the risk profile completely of that money and not making it vulnerable to a single event, which can destroy it. So secure sufficient assets and protect them. We need to diversify in this particular quadrant. Liquidity is critical. We spoke about quadrant one, it's normal to be illiquid. Again, no debt. Why? Because it's not tax effective. And then lastly, this demands objective care. Any questions on quadrant three? Good evening. We'll come back to that. And then quadrant four is when you've got enough of quadrant three, and we call these excess assets. I'm not too sure if you can ever have excess assets, but here you can apply a completely different set of rules. You can almost do what you like. Match your objective. So if this is money that you want to use in a year's time, you don't put it near the market. If this is money you want to use in 10 years' time, you don't keep it in cash. So match the investment strategy with what it is you want from it. Your, stru your structures around this become quite important because if this is long-term money, stuff like trust, trust makes and structures make, make complete sense here. You can be bold. And this is a, a, a massive field that's growing so quickly in South Africa at the moment, the idea, the idea around philanthropy. Philanthropy fits here. It doesn't fit here in quadrant three. You know the old saying, in the aircraft, put the, put the mask on yourself before you put it on your kids. That is putting the mask on yourself. Help yourself and your family before you seek to help others. But philanthropy is a massively growing concept in South Africa. Okay, so there they are, in, um, completely on one screen. Now, we spoke about the tension that exists between going to lifestyle assets and going to accumulating sufficient wealth. Do you notice anything between these two sets of rules? So we've got concentration of resources, we've got diversification, we've got subjective involvement, we've got objective care, we've got illiquidity is normal, we've got liquidity, we've got gearing is okay, we've got debt free. So what's interesting is that the process of creating wealth, the rules, are completely the opposite to the rules of living off your wealth. And that's the hard part because this is subjective. It's stuff that you can hold and touch and sweat about and lose sleep about every day. That's not allowed to happen here. Okay, and as we move on, I want to take you through a little bit more detail on, on how we then treat that. The big, the big thing is that you cannot be objective about your own stuff. Okay, because it's yours. 
So, let's, let's go through these rules one by one, and I want to talk to you in a little bit more detail about, about each one. So, the first one is you need to secure sufficient assets, and you then need to protect them. How do you do that? So, the first point is that, you know, you might associate protecting with preservation, with wealth preservation, which is quite a boring concept, I think you'd agree. But protecting doesn't just mean preserving. To protect your wealth, you need to grow it as well. But you need to grow it at the appropriate level of risk. So, protecting means preserving plus growing it. Secondly, what is enough? How do you, how do you determine that? Now, I'm sorry, this is an incredibly busy slide. You're not going to see too much detail on the screen. But the kind of process we, we, we would adopt in, 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 in doing this, this exercise is the following. This is an example of a, of a couple, um, and it's a fictitious example, it's, it's, it's no one I know. Um, husband and wife, two children, son um, last year of university, daughter four years of university to go. Age 55 he is, she's two years younger, and decided wants to retire from the, from the corporate at, at age 52. Okay, so the first thing you would do is you'd map out. So when we speak about a road map, map um, a framework, you'd map out the entire lifestyle down to age, this is 90 by the way, I'm sorry this isn't too clear, but let me walk you through it. So in the blue, you can see these are all noughts, and that ends at 62. So this is the income they would earn for the next 10 years, sorry, next 7 years. Ignore the yellow for the moment. I'm just going to walk across the screen if you don't mind. On the right-hand side, they've decided that their lifestyle cost is 50,000 rand a month. They need to pay for four more years of university for their daughter and one more year of university for their son. They want to replace their vehicles every five odd years. Um, beyond 75, I asked them not to drive, so the cars end there. Um, holiday travel, they wanted to travel till 75, a, a trip worth 80,000 Rand every second year. And you'll notice that these numbers grow because we've just allowed for inflation. And then two weddings to be paid for. Um, these are contributions to retirement funds. And unfortunately, we can't see this right-hand column, but that's where they've, they, they, save, they save more than they spend. And what this boils down to is two columns. This column here, oh, sorry. When their pension funds pay out, this would be the stream of pension for them. Okay, so if we stack their expenses up against their incomes, we're going to end up with a balancing number, right? Now, if there's a number here, it means that they are spending more than they're earning. If there's a number in the right-hand column, it means they're making some savings. Now, unfortunately, you can't see that because that little bar there, but they really make savings in four years. In, sorry, in five years. But beyond age 62, their capital needs to give them this for the rest of their lives. Now, the, the real question they seek from me when we have this discussion is, well, will I have enough? Okay, so we've, we've, we've set this out for them. I'll give the answer in four slides time, but I want to just take you through some things um, in between. So the first thing you need to do is to quantify and clarify your assets relative to your spending. So the answer is, do I have enough? The, the, the question is, do I have enough? The answer is, how much do you spend? Simple as that. Okay. So we started to do this using this cash flow analysis that I've just shown you. The next thing is you, you need to match the investments with the commitments. Now, the way to do this is whatever you need to spend tomorrow is in cash only. In fact, the next two years worth of spending sits in cash, in capital, and you spend it. You don't rely on yield. You purely rely on RAND cash. The next three to four years beyond that, you can afford to allocate to slightly more volatile assets but nowhere near the market. We term this prudent, but this would be stuff like bonds and maybe some, some conservative hedge funds. Once you set up the six-year buffer, that, by the way, always runs ahead of you, whether you're 52 or whether you're 82, you have a six-year buffer ahead of you that you can spend from and hasn't been impacted by any volatility no matter what happens. The rest of the money you can afford to allocate to growth assets and in line with the risk profile that you might choose for yourself. Okay, so investing in line with your spending pattern means you, you hold the right assets to spend at the right time. Okay, and you protect them 
by holding your next six or seven years worth in assets that will not be affected by volatility. So here's the result. By the way, this couple had accumulated, in, if you looked at their retirement annuities and their pension funds, about four million was in there and they had about just over four million of savings at 55, which is a reasonable number. Now, two things. When this projection is done, it's done very conservatively. So you use a real projection. So this is in real terms on the top there. And secondly, you use a, we use a 2.5% real return, okay, which might seem ultra conservative, but you know, if you project a 10% real, anyone can retire today. So you keep it very, very conservative, which means that if you can retire and, or, or, or stop working under those conditions, you can stop working under most conditions. And what you'll see here is, is, is what happens to their, their discretionary money and their retirement money over time. Now that ends up at 2 million Rand in real terms at age 90 using a very conservative projection. I would say to those particular people, give that a tick. That's exactly, that works. You can afford to retire. If we did this in Rand terms, by the way, this, this graph would actually keep going upwards. But it means nothing because, you know, as you saw from that particular graph, the 50,000 Rand a month was the equivalent of 170,000 Rand a month in 20 years' time. So projecting in Rand terms makes no sense. In real terms, that's actually a, a good projection. Okay, now that might go, that might fly in the face of your sense that, you know, you don't eat into your capital over time. Again, in Rand terms, you haven't. This is in real terms. And very, very few projections that we see in real terms, in fact, stay straight. You're incredibly lucky if that happens. Because then you're spending very, very little of what you've accumulated. Or you've accumulated a heck of a lot and you can't spend it. Okay, any questions on that so far? I think you are. Look, firstly, after tax. Okay. And secondly, I mean, what do you expect from equities over time? I mean, if you look at equities historically, and don't, don't just take the South African example of the last decade, because that's, that's a, a pretty unique sample. But equities should give you inflation plus six over time. Okay. Now, remembering that you, I'm assuming you know, that we're not all brave enough to invest our entire life savings in equities. Correct. What are you going to get from cash? You're going to get a negative real return. So, so you'd expect your projection rate to be somewhere between 0 and 6. Fair? Okay, so, so you could maybe take 3. We just think that we'd rather err, and I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm speaking from, from, from a Citadel perspective. We'd rather err on, a, on the conservative side and say, look, cause, because you do this. Okay, so, so, so one other thing. The danger is that you, you hold out your spreadsheet and you do it for, for 12 years. Now look what happens. All right, they retire here. So you start your projection and you do it for 12 years and you go from there to about there. And that looks, that looks great, doesn't it? I mean, 10 years. The problem with compounding is that it accentuates success. It accentuates failure. If you stop working and 15 years down the track, you haven't saved enough, there's nothing you can do. There's no way you can go back into the working environment and start again. So I, I take your point, but our view is always to be ultra conservative and make clients aware of it. What you can do is play with the sensitivities. And it's quite amazing. If you add half a percent to this return, the graph does that. So it's incredibly sensitive to, 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 to playing with those variables. But therein lies the danger also of projecting too high. Exactly. So you'll notice I've gone to, to 90. I think that's conservative, actually. All right, so um, again, we'd rather be ultra-conservative in the projection than, than, than not. Also, it has to be said that a lot of people I deal with that, that, that retire don't actually retire. They, they, they carry on working. So the 50 a month is, is actually 30 a month because they're earning 20. Okay. But that I would give a big tick to, just to summarize. Okay. What's quite important about this, the, the, the point before that about matching investments with commitments is that, and this, this might sound trite, but let me just say it, is that it makes no sense to invest tomorrow's money in the market. It makes no sense to invest 10 years' time 
It's money in cash. Okay. Each are equally dangerous. So we need to understand the, the implications of short-term volatility and the implications that not exposing yourself to volatility create in the long term. I do hear the comment, but I, I'm a little bit nervous to invest in the market because I might lose all my money. Now, if you think about that, you actually, if that happens, markets have gone to zero, okay? So that's not going to happen. But the one way you can lose all your money is that. And we spoke about, we threw the throwaway was master bond a little bit earlier. But investing your, your funds in, on the balance sheet of one institution, which can actually go to the wall, is the one way you lose everything. Okay, so in, in, this, in this quadrant, that's why we speak about diversification. Let's say you're in a unit trust, yes, yes. Provi provided, of course, they're abiding by the regulation, but yes, no, absolutely. But if you go and put your money into a debenture, okay, or, some, or, or everything into somebody's pref, as we saw in the last couple of years, you could be in big trouble, okay. And then, and this is the important one, because I'm a mathematician by trade, so compounding is, uh, is an important thing to me. Let me just take you through a little, little bit of a fun exercise. So you have, you have two investors, investor A and investor B, obviously, and they invest money for three years. And this is their return pattern. So in year one, investor A earns 15, investor B earns 10. Year two, uh oh we know what investor one was doing, so they down 10, investor B makes 10 again, and year three, a brilliant bounce back. Who had the better result? They drew no money, by the way. It stayed in. Okay. Absolutely. The power of compounding. And the skewness of loss, which I'll talk about in a couple of seconds as well. Okay. So, in, and remember, please, I'm talking about this third quadrant. I'm not implying for a second that you're going to sell your equity portfolio that's, that, that you're having fun with and invested in 19 asset classes. But in this particular quadrant where you're having to, to protect and grow your wealth, creating stable return is incredibly important because of the power of compounding. Okay, just to re-emphasize that protecting is not just preservation, okay? It's preservation plus growth. And coming back to Mr. Buffett, he speaks about, you know, you, you buy a quality company and you never sell it. If you overpay for a company, no matter how good it is, it will never make money for you. Okay, so the critical thing in making any asset class call is are you paying the right price at that particular time? Never overpay for an asset. Right, that was securing assets and protecting them. Right, now we talk about diversification. And this is a, this is a very interesting one because it's, it's a commonly misunderstood concept in investments. So the first obvious thing around diversification is local offshore, right? How much money is going offshore? How much money is, is staying local? That is obviously a critical decision. What's really interesting is four years ago, no one was interested in taking money offshore. Suddenly at, what is it today? 13.30 was yesterday. You know, people are falling all over themselves to get money offshore. I spoke about seeing five rand crises earlier. At 14 rand to the dollar in 2003, I think it was, or four, exactly the same thing happened. Remember, you could take off, was it 500? And people were just desperate to get money offshore because somebody planning the Olympics had called it to 25 to the dollar. Okay, and emotion just took over. But diversification, just to come back to the point, the first, the most topical form of diversification now is local versus offshore. We're a big advocate of holding a significant amount of one's investment assets offshore. Not because of any lack of loyalty to South Africa, it just makes complete sense to diversify your wealth into asset classes and assets and themes that you don't find in South Africa. That's what diversification means. Then diversification, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about diversification uh, amongst institutions and assets uh, consecutively. So I often come across clients that have said to me, well, I own investments in company A, B, not shares, investments through company A, B, C, and D. 
Okay, and let's not mention any names. Now, they're all smart people. They've all got really smart people working for them. And, and I haven't had space to include all the asset classes, but here's the range of stuff they can invest in. Now, remember, in this industry, it's very much a relative game. Everyone's trying to be top quartile. So you have to assume that when you allocate your money to a particular, co to a particular company, regardless, they, they, get, they more than likely will be allocating it into the, to the most appropriate asset class. So what happens if you're sitting here thinking, well, look, I've diversified into four companies, but all these smart people are doing the right thing. You've done two things. You've lost your economy of scale in fees, firstly. And secondly, you've actually concentrated your assets without realizing it. So the key thing when you look at your portfolio is not who you're invested through, it's what they're actually holding. So diversification isn't about brand. Diversification is about holding asset classes that behave differently in the same set of circumstances. Now, I can see you all putting your necks out, but um, what this is, is we take a look at the world and we take a view on, on statistically on expected returns from asset classes. It's not a projection, uh, sorry, a, a prediction. It's not a projection. It's purely a statistical measure. And it gives us a good feeling for what we should be looking at on the right, on your right, and what we shouldn't be looking at on your left. So we'd probably cut away all of this. Now, if you weren't diversifying, you'd go straight to the right-hand side and say, well, look, let's put everything into South African resources. You'd be pretty brave to do that. <laughs> okay. But what you probably should be doing is holding five or six of these things that sit on the right-hand side. Okay, because that's what diversification means. Okay. It also doesn't mean, sorry, holding the second highest one. What, will, what this will tell you, though, is that, and it's, it rings true for, for us, is that the dominant asset class in a portfolio that we would manage would be global equities. That's, that, that is very clear there. And then, obviously, global, you can see the global property plays a role. This is looking at the world from South Africa. Let me just show you that if you were looking at the world from Mars, where does South Africa feature there? Okay, emerging market equities. Right, I'll give you that. Again, like, like, like resources, you'd be very, very brave to be going there right now with all your money. The point is just that if you look at South Africa in a global context, it is tiny. Okay, so it does make sense as a South African investor to have a significant portion of your assets offshore. Again, you can access themes that you can't access in South Africa. Okay. Any questions on those last two slides? Or? Is the last column U.S. equity? Uh, EM equity, emerging market equity. The last uh, yeah, emerging market equity. Sorry, the, the previous one in, on, the, on, the, on the South African slide was, was global equity. Uh, U.S. equity sits over here. Interesting enough, that's our favorite asset class. So, again, uh, projected return doesn't reflect certainty. That's purely a statistical measure. Okay. And again, if you're wanting to diversify, you hold a bunch of those things on the right-hand side, not necessarily one of them. Okay. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about risk in a couple of seconds as well. But... Um, Anybody recognize that? That's the efficient frontier, right? Now, it's a misconception that risk and return have a one-on-one -on -one relationship. That's why this curve flattens off. So looking at asset classes from a South African point of view, real return on the vertical and risk on the horizontal. So as I walk over to the right, I'm taking more risk. What I'm expecting is for the asset class's return to go up, which would make sense. So what's quite interesting is that global equity sits in the sweet spot up there. And that's purely because of its current measure. Um, global bonds are a disaster, it looks like. Now, what diversification means is I look at global property and global equity. What that's saying is that for the same level of risk here, global equity is going to give me a much bigger return, which I guess one would expect. Um, 
But what happens if you combine global property and global equity? The new dot's going to appear somewhere over here. Now, if you add SA property in, it's going to come somewhere over here. What you're trying to do is to get onto this line as best you can. What you're going to avoid are things like global bonds. So that we can hedge funds, fantastic asset class to add into a portfolio. So as you start to mix these together, you're going to try and you never probably won't get closer to this line or, or onto this line, but you will get closer to this line. So it's about creating the optimum level of risk you're prepared to take by combining these asset classes. And I'll extend that to the offshore example. And again, obviously, you know, equities again form the sweet spot. Um, and again, sovereign debt, something you'd be quite nervous of. But again, start to combine asset classes. You can ratchet down the risk, maybe ratchet down the return a little bit, but still get a very good return on, or, or, or good uh, risk return ratio. By the way, that, what that muddle through means is that that's just, if we, look, if we have a look at the world, assuming it's just going to keep going. Not Goldilocks and not deflation. Okay. Now, we spoke earlier about putting all your money, putting, putting your money in the market and losing it all. Okay. Um, that doesn't happen unless the market goes to nil. What happens when you invest in equities and the values vary is volatility. And we don't see volatility as risk. Volatility isn't risk. Volatility is just volatility. What is risk? So let's, just, let's have a quick look through, through risk. And I, I'm going I'm to cover four risks. The first one is the risk of putting all your money in cash forever and after tax just going backwards. Guaranteed financial suicide in the long term. The second risk is losing all your money because you put it into one inst onto one institution's balance sheet and that institution goes to the wall. The third risk is the risk of your capital varying from time to time. Okay, but again, we don't see it as risk, we just see that as volatility. And the last risk is the risk of not being able to get to your money when you need it. Okay. Now these are all relevant. But these are risks that you have to embrace in any kind of portfolio in that third quadrant that we spoke about. Because you need to have some cash. But remember we spoke about the first two years sitting in cash. So you're only taking two years worth of inflation risk in that type of approach. The one you can avoid completely is that. If you do your research properly, your due diligence properly, or the investment partner that you're working with has done that work properly. You have to embrace volatility. So, you know, everything is a combination of you need cash, but you need to embrace volatility. It's just how much of each that you embrace. And then lastly, you might need to embrace some form of liquidity risk. But what you don't do in this quadrant is go and lock your money into a five-year contract or a ten-year contract. That you don't do. You, you want to be able to access your money in a reasonable period of time. Now, I know hedge funds have got a bad rap uh, over time because you don't, you, you, they don't price daily. In a way, that's the way of protecting the people that invest in them. Okay, now I wouldn't define that as liquidity risk. For me, liquidity risk is, is locking your money away for a, for, a, for a very long period of time, subject to different rules. So just be very, very aware of that. The skewness of loss. So one of the issues with volatility and emotion and panicking is, is of course, if you've got 100 and you lose 20, you need to make 25% on the 80 that's left to get back to your 100. Okay, so, 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 so locking in losses can be an incredibly destructive thing. Um, and you know, I guess some of the, the, the pertinent examples of that were people rushing to take their money off at 14 rand to the dollar in 2002. It took almost 10 years for that to rectify itself. Now, had you panicked halfway through, you locked in significant, massive, massive, massive wealth destruction. And that's one of the points I made about emotion earlier. Emotion can sometimes get the better of you. Okay. So we spoke about liquidity. So minimize any form of lock-in. I didn't say lock it out completely, but just minimize it as much as you can. It allows you to retain flexibility, to take use of opportunities or other opportunities as you see them. If you invest in line with your withdrawal pattern, then liquidity will never be an issue. Okay, no debt. Again, we spoke about this because it's not tax effective here. 
So you're never geared to invest either. Uh, if you do that here, Prime at the moment is what, nine and a half? That's quite a tall order to have to beat every year um, to make money. Now this is a very controversial one and I'm, I risk being thrown out of the room, but for me, and this is a personal view, investing in, in property for the purposes of renting does not belong in this third quadrant. I'm not saying it's a bad investment. It belongs in quadrant one because it's a business. You're a rent collector, you're a repairer, you're a replacer of geezers, you're a, an administrator, you get called out. It's, an inv it's, it's a business, in my view. It's not an investment. Okay, so, so it's a, obviously it's a different asset class, but I don't see it as fitting in to this um, wealth preservation quadrant. Okay. We said this a little bit earlier. You, it, it's impossible to be objective about your own stuff. Anybody disagree with me on that one? Okay. So what's the temptation if you're directly involved, hands-on involved with your own third quadrant investments? Is that you're very tempted to trade, get in and out. Um, we do this for a living. It's all we do. We know we cannot time the market. It's absolutely, you might be lucky once, you might be incredibly lucky twice, but you might be very unlucky the third time. So it's something that, 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 we're, that we're just trying to avoid completely. So, so my point here is that you need to find somebody that can stand between you and your emotions once you've set up a framework like this and just take the heat out of the, out of the decision. This is a controversial one, it could be, but if you're walking a road with somebody, make sure there's an incentive for them to, to create um, growth for you, to create wealth for you. Just make sure they're not remunerated on the basis of making transactions for you. Churn's the dirty word that is thrown around. Just make sure your advice is all-encompassing. So if you have a trust, make sure your trust talks to your will. Make sure your will talks to your trust. Make sure that your trust administration is correct. Make sure that whoever's advising you is keeping these records for you. And then be very careful if you're dealing with two or three different people of creating a relative race. Because if advisor number one knows that they're racing against advisor number two, all they have to do is beat advisor number two. Like outrunning a bear. Uh, you only have to be faster than the slower person. So. Just be very careful of creating the wrong behavior if you're using two or three different advisors because you might end up with the same bad result from all of them. Okay, so, whoopsie, let me just go back one. There are the five rules around that third quadrant. I'm going to summarize that for you in the next slide, but any questions on that? I'm getting a free ride here, I can't believe. Okay, so in summary, we spend our lives building capital that we can ultimately use to sustain our lifestyles and those of our children and their children's children going forward. And that involves certain things and it involves, it involves certain behaviors. We create a lifestyle for ourselves, assets that aren't pretty useless to us in monetary terms, but give us pleasure, that joy. But we also build, we take out of this risk pool, which is concentrated into a diversified risk pool, which can sustain us indefinitely. Uh, and it's this thing that we live out, live out of, sorry. The rules attached to this quadrant are completely the opposite of the rules attached to what we do every single day. Okay. And the most important rule is you get out of the way. <laughs> in the third quadrant. When you have enough money to do this for yourself, and it's easy to determine, I showed you the exercise, you can afford to get involved in things like philanthropy, etc., etc., with a whole different set of rules and a whole different set of administration and a whole different set of laws. Okay. And then just to close, this is the one thing that we wake up with every single morning as an investment team and investment group. The future will surprise us. So just bear that in mind. Whenever you think you know exactly what's going to happen next, it invariably won't.
Thank you very much. There must be some questions. Come. Must be. I've got one. In yeah. Your, in your cash flow chart, there, I'm going back to the two and a half percent. Yes. Is my biggest risk living too long? Which is a weird yes. risk, but my biggest risk is I get to around 10 or around 15. Yes. If your graph had that pattern, the answer is probably yes. But remember, that assumes that there'd be no intervention in between. You know, so, so the idea of that exercise isn't something that you do today and then it gathers dust. It's something you repeat every year. So the job of your advisor is to say to you, look, it's been a tough four years. Let's not change our approach because of that. But hold on a second. You've broken the rule here. You're now spending 80 a month, not 50. And that's going to that's gonna kill this thing. So the idea of what your advisor needs to do for you is to, is to temper any big deviations from the framework that you've set out to create. So your risk is A, living too long, if you're marginal. And I don't, that for me wasn't a marginal cash flow, it was okay. But if you were marginal, because sometimes you have to be, you have to stop working. Um, and secondly, deviating from, and look, unexpected things happen. You know, car gets stolen twice uh, and you weren't insured, uh, whatever, you know. Um, unexpected things do happen. But then you temper the plan to try and make sure that you last no matter, no matter how long, but yes. That, that is a big risk. Longevity, absolutely. So the answer is more red wine. Okay. Okay, so, so in this case, where somebody's got 10 years to go, uh, what you missed is, I'm sorry, this little block here blocked out those, it, it actually, I don't know, can we go back to that slide? Go back to it. Let me just, okay. So, so, so what that said was, if you, if you just kept doing what you were doing for the next 10 years, or 7 years, 7 or 8 years, um, your lifestyle spending remained roughly in line with that, and you were able to, you can see here, oopsie, um, there were a couple of years where you had to pull out of your savings. One was the, it was a motor car and a, an overseas trip in one particular year. But there were some savings that happened here. But you, weren't, you didn't have to touch your capital in the next eight years. In fact, you could build on it. And you could probably accumulate, this is about 700,000 Rand, I think, if you add those together. <laughs> Do the cash flow next year. You know, just make sure that when you've set your, so what, I'm sorry, what this doesn't show is if in those graphs, you, it'll, it would show you that at the end of the second year, the number was maybe 9 million or 9 and a half. You just keep an eye on that. But it's when you get to this year, when you've stopped working, that's when it actually becomes even more important because you're not, be, you can liken, when you get to 63, it's like a bath with the plug pulled out. Okay, so, so and you've turned the tap off. Okay, where is the tap still on now? And that's when the cash flow becomes, becomes important. And, and remember, the cash flow tells you two things. It tells you that you've still got enough, but it also tells you, if you go by the rule of investing in line with your withdrawal pattern, that slide that we, um, just, could you pull this, for me two slides, please? Other way. Uh, other way, go forward. Uh, other way, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, one more, one more. There we go. The cash flow tells me how to invest this money for a client. So while while these particular clients are working, they don't need any of that stuff prudent or or or, um, or stable. They just need growth. But when they when they've stopped working and they need us to 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 pay them money every month, they do need that stuff. So. Why the cash flow becomes critically important then is it tells me exactly what I need to hold for them in cash because it's the next two years and in prudent and in growth. Okay, so to answer your question in a very long-winded way, until they retire, you've set yourself a framework and you kind of keep your eye on the targets, but it's not the be-all and end-all because you never know, you know, growth does, it's not, it doesn't always look, but you want to get to that rough area in seven years' time, but it's when you stop, when you stop and the, you pull the plug out of the bath that you've got to start matching your assets and that's when it becomes very important. Yes? So jump in quickly. If that slide solves the question of asset allocation, how much Yes, 100% right. The answer is on that 100%. And the, the one, I'm sorry, I'll come back to you in a second, sorry. 
What you've got to do inside your growth is decide on your risk profile. So this could be anything from equities only to belts and braces to that's a risk profile discussion. So you've got, you've got, an, you've got a capital adequacy exercise, you've got an, um, an asset matching exercise, and then you've got a risk profile discussion. And that's what, how much risk are you comfortable with in the growth part of your portfolio. Okay. I'll try to remember the order of those questions. So, okay. So, so, so the first one was, um, so, so, so my lesson in the five rand crises is when the rand never gets to its weakest point slowly. Now we've seen it hit 14. The first time it hit 14, by the way, it, it was on a weekend. And it was back at thir almost under 13 by Monday morning with two trades, two small trades. So it was just unbelievably volatile in that short period of time. It's, it's tried to hit 14 a couple of times. If you ask me our view on the RAND is we can see it weaker before it gets stronger in the short term. So if you, if you said give me a, a six month, I would just, I'd wash my hands. I've, we've got absolutely no idea. But we do get a strong sense that in the next two or three years we're seeing it around about 12 again. It, it's not going to, that example of the sun that said 25 RAND, we can't see that. It just makes no sense to us. Um, but in the short term it can be quite extreme, but we don't know what that number is. Very easy to, it's very easy to take a graph and keep walking, you know. It's, it's, uh, um, with respect to ever wrote whatever article, I just want to say one thing about that. Now, you can, you can, predict, you can predict, predict disaster and be wrong nine times and be right the tenth time and be held as a genius. And we, there's lots of examples of that. But you can predict something good and be wrong once and be seen as an idiot. So, you know, investing based on extreme views, never. So if you're asking, I know what you're trying to ask me, though. should I take money offshore now? <laughs> Look, if you're, if you're trying to be tactical about it, I'd say no. But for me, taking money offshore is a long-term strategic decision. I would do it. 13 Rand to 13 Rand 30 happened overnight a few days ago. So it's, it's, it's quite tricky to time it. But obviously, I wouldn't want to do it at 14 Rand 50. But at these levels, so what if it's 12 Rand in three years' time? Because ultimately, the RAND will keep going with, with uh, according to, well, technically according to parity, it doesn't do that. But ultimately, it will keep going. It has to, economically. But at these levels, if you're going to make a long-term strategic decision, I would do it, in my view. Maybe not everything at the same time. But again, the decision to go offshore, not again, the decision to go offshore is a valuations decision. It's not a RAND decision only. So the fact that you can, you can go and buy incredible businesses in the States at low PEs that you can see are just slam dunk investments if you're prepared to be patient with them. In my mind, you, that's the imperative. It's a valuations call, not, not just a currency call. Your second question was, there are, there are lots of institutions in South Africa um, that have been doing this. So I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I just need to tell you, we've got a 15 year track record dealing offshore. Hedge funds and hedge funds and equity. So there are lots of people that do that, but you're not going to find the answer in a product. You're going to find the answer in, in a partner that you can walk a road with and that, that has got experience. Your third question was, okay, okay. So can I come back to this if you don't mind? So because it, it needs to talk to the discipline of the approach. So in these two, you'll have no non-rand exposure. Um, we do actually, we for example, hold some offshore assets in here, but we hedge the currency out of it. Where you take your currency exposure is here. Because you can tolerate volatility in your six year plus money. And here, at this stage, we are about 55% offshore. Have been for some time. Um, yeah, in fact, historically, we, 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 we've always had quite a strong offshore bend. Because we just, we just feel it's a financial planning imperative to, to diversify across. Yeah, yes, yes. And um, that's a combination of, of global property, global hedge funds, and global equity. But global equity, as you saw, in our view, is, is should be the dominant asset class. And the return of the offshore versus the South African one within that portfolio. Okay. So you, you've got to look at, so, so as a South African, if you look at the RAND return, I mean, offshore equities have shot the lights out, but they haven't. They're down 10% over a year. But in RAND terms, they're up about 20. So 
you just got to be careful. You need to just firstly just get the currency away from it. South African equities have outperformed offshore equities in the last in the last year. Um, in rand terms, global equities have outperformed rand equities. Um, but South African equities, are, you know, the, the, the fascinating thing with South Africa is our peers, obviously, aren't the U.S. and the U.K. and Europe. Our peers are the usual: Brazil, Russia, India, China, Turkey, Korea. We look, we smiling compared to what they've been through. Apart from their currencies, our currency is pretty similar to theirs, but our market we're at an all-time high. Unbelievable! Look at other emerging markets; they have taken serious pain. Yeah, yeah. You know, so so in the emerging market space, and, and and while it was the most popular asset class, that's why, because that's it, it's taken such pain. So it just looks like value; it might get a heck of a lot cheaper still. Um, but certainly, South African equities have outperformed uh, global equities in dollar versus rand locally. Yes. But that's not necessarily sustainable. I mean, the, the sum that keeps going around in my head is, I mean, uh, so, so we've got to, to 52,000 points, 53,000 points. Um, and when the markets fell in 2012, I think it went down to 18. Okay, now to replicate that, that amazing performance since 2012, it's going to have to go to, what, 150? I, I just, for the life of me, can't see that. When I look, when I look offshore and I, and, I, and I look at amazing businesses, um, I just, for me, that, that, that makes, intuitively, it just makes a lot more sense. Again, you've got a huge range of stocks that can drive returns. We've seen in our market 10, 11 stocks have driven performance. If you went in one of those 10 or 11 stocks, you might not have made money in this market, which has made money. So, um, but offshore assets have got a bad rap in the last decade, definitely.